So, I'm currently recording this in a guest bed at my friend's house, but you know, you ever feel like just making something? Because I am literally midway through a move to a new home near Lake Erie with my husband. And my camera equipment is currently in boxes being moved across the country from Victoria, BC by movers. Thankfully, I have the Retro Freak, my laptop, and a capture card on hand. So on the suggestion of several of the folks in my Discord server, which all patrons get access to, let's take a look at some weird Nintendo Famicom games. I was suggested a lot of titles by viewers for this vid, and I've narrowed it down to my 10 favorites. So today on Stuff We Play, it's time to dive into 10 weird must-play Famicom games in 10 minutes. But first, let me tell you about today's sponsor, Zen Market. See, originally this video is going to be on the Advanced Pico Bina, Sega's true final console. And that video is still coming, and will also be made possible by Zen Market, as they were kind enough to send me that unit itself. I also got a Japanese version of the Mega Man ZX and Zero collection on Switch, and some Warhammer figures from my friend Jazzy. So they're really rad. Anyways, Zen Market is a Japanese import service that lets you shop at a variety of Japanese shops with ease. eBay Japan, Amazon Japan, Rakuten, and more. You can even bid on auctions from my favorite Japanese website, Yahoo Auctions Japan. Shipping is fast and affordable, and you can even store your items at Zen Market's warehouse in Japan and combine them before having them shipped to your address nearly anywhere else in the world. Follow the link in the description below to check out Zen Market today, and if you sign up now, get 300 yen to put towards your first purchase. Thank you again, Zen Market, for making this video possible. And now, with that, let's dive into covering all 10 of these games without letting this video get too long. And for good measure, I even have a timer! Otoki is by far one of the most creative games I've ever played. It's a musical shoot 'em up where your little ship can fire in 8 directions. There's a catchy music track in each stage, though the melody only plays when you fire, with the sound differing slightly depending on which direction you fire your weapon in. The goal of each stage is to collect music notes until you fill up 5 of these note slots on the bottom of the screen. You collect these by shooting at these orbs containing, well, more music notes. There are power-ups too, which you get by running in these letter orbs, and once you reach the boss, you fight off against some giant music notes. Yeah, can you tell there's a theme here? Anyways, if I had to compare the overall feel here to anything, I'd say it's kind of like Fantasy Zone, but more musically themed. It's a really charming and fun little game that gets just that much more weird charm by being a Famicom Disk System title. Nothing gets me going like a good floppy. So who has ever played Splatterhouse? It was an arcade game with a really rad TurboGrafx-16 port where you play as this Jason Voorhees looking dude as you go around beating up a variety of tropey horror movie enemies. It's really gory and violent and honestly cool as hell. Also something that Nintendo of America would never let slide. I mentioned that because Splatterhouse got a pseudo sequel in the form of Splatterhouse Winpaku Graffiti exclusively for the Famicom in Japan. And this isn't to be confused with the actual numbered Splatterhouse sequels on the Sega Genesis. Anyways, in Win Paku Graffiti, you play as a super deformed version of Jason as you go through a variety of stages that may or may not have been part of a film set. Fairly difficult, way charming, even has a level system. This one is one I've wanted to talk about on YouTube for a good while now, and it's an absolute must play. The stage theming alone will really make it a must play for any horror movie fans. People love crossover games. I know this because Smash Brothers and Marvel vs. Capcom exist. And indeed, Konami had their own crossover, but only in Japan. Instead of being a fighting game, this is a platformer filled with numerous playable characters. Konami World is under attack, so it's up to you as Konami Man, Konami Lady to save it. 
you've gotta go save a bunch of characters in a variety of maze-like stages too, which you choose from this Mega Man S stage select screen. And yes, all of them are based on a variety of Konami properties. Traverse through locales such as Dracula's Castle from Castlevania, and lock characters such as Goemon to save Konami World. It's honestly really charming, and there's even a fan-made English translation. Overall, it's really cool to see this kind of take on a crossover game, especially as you can literally switch characters at any point throughout the stages by pressing up and jump. I just wish stages had their own music tracks instead of characters having individual themes that play in each level, and that they're a little less maze-like. Overall, not for everyone, but still really good. Actually, these issues were all mostly fixed in YY World 2. Released a few years after the first in 1991, this one takes a more linear approach, with many of the stages being auto-scrollers. I dare say it borders on being a shoot-'em-up, except at the points where it literally becomes a shoot-'em-up. Instead of having access to all the characters by the end of the game, you instead select a set of three from the start, and then your Konami Man Android thing can transform into them temporarily by picking up a power-up. Everyone is here, from Simon Belmont to a literal baby. This one definitely leans on the earlier Konami games for inspiration more, and I mean a lot of inspiration, with one of the later levels literally just being gripped straight out of Gradius. But you know what? In its own way, and I know I've used this word a lot, it's charming. I like it more than the original. Definitely give this one a try. New Ghostbusters 2 is another game I've wanted to cover forever now. This one also is specifically called New Ghostbusters 2. It was developed by Hudson Soft and exclusively released in Japan for the Famicom. It's also not to be confused with the god-awful Ghostbusters 2 game that was released stateside. In this version of Ghostbusters 2, you play as two of the four, wait, five Ghostbusters, yeah I see you hiding there in a the character select, as you go around zapping and catching ghosts. You control one Ghostbuster while the AI controls the other, and surprisingly, the AI is pretty dang competent. Most of the time. Wonder if this would be better with a second player. Anyways, the name of the game is Zap and Catch. You have to stun a ghost with one before you can catch it with the other. Bosses especially here require a lot of strategy to fully do them in, and the stages are also really cool to look at as well, but my favorite being this one in the subway. Cause, um, well, y-y-y'all y know I like trains. What I'm getting at is, do you like Ghostbusters, or even remotely find what you see on the screen interesting? Then you'll probably like this game. Oh look, it's a first-party Nintendo game that never made it to North America! No, I shit you not! Shigeru Miyamoto designed this thing! You know, the Mario guy. Anyways, Devil World is a Pac-Man-esque maze game where you use crosses and Bibles to collect pellets and shoot up monsters while the devil himself dictates what direction the stage will scroll in. This leads to a lot of wonky feeling deaths where the stage moves in a way that literally traps you and you end up being quite literally trapped in a corner. However, it is a unique concept and just the novelty of it being a first party Nintendo game featuring Satan may make this one worth giving a shot for longtime Nintendo fans. Joy Mech Fight is a fighting game from the tail end of the Famicom's life, coming out in 1993. Here you play these Rayman-looking robots as you smack the ever-living shit out of each other. It's a Famicom fighting game, which means that, thanks to being on a console that literally only had two buttons at its disposal, it's rather limited in scope. But the fact that each fighter gets their own arena and that you unlock new fighters after you defeat them means that there's a lot of fun to be had. Cosmic Epsilon is perhaps one of the most graphically impressive games on the Famicom. In this one, you take a view from behind a spaceship mech as you blast the hell out of enemies in this really beautifully smoothing scrolling world. Like, damn, I have no idea how they managed to make this so... smooth. It's hard as hell, admittedly, I feel like a lot of the deaths are due to awkwardness that come from there being some wonky hit detection, but it's such a unique experience I think it's worth checking out at least once. Honestly, for those of you who enjoy a tough old school challenge and love the likes of Space Harrier, you'll probably get a lot out of this one. Sexy Invaders is probably the weirdest game on this list. Admittedly, it's one that's a must-play because it has a bit of a what-the-fuck factor. It's also a Famicom Disk game too, so it has that going for it. In fact, due to being a Famicom Disk System game, there are a ton of load times. That said, that could be because it's also an unlicensed game. Because all the cool kids are doing piracy, don't you know? But at its heart, it's just Space Invaders. A decent version of it, sure, but why is that a must-play? Well, hear me out. 
You know, some games are so wild, you need to experience them at least once. Not play to completion, but at least just play them once. Because you know what Space Invaders was lacking in the arcade? That's right, anime titties, hell yeah! To end off, the final game I want to talk about today is the title that nearly single-handedly made me decide to do this video. Well, that and Atoki. The game in question is Lagrange Point, and for context here, we need to talk about two other games before we can dive into this one. The first of these is the original Fantasy Star. Released at the tail end of 1987 for the Sega Master System, the Famicom's main competitor, this was the defining RPG for Sega's little 8-bit powerhouse. Eschewing the traditional fantasy setting that was found in pretty much all RPGs of the era for a futuristic one, complete with robots, first-person dungeons, and travel between different planets, it's easy to see why this one left such a huge impact on so many of those who played it. The other game we need to talk about, though, is Castlevania 3. Released in 1989, this was an incredibly solid platform that's considered by many, including myself, to be the best of the NES Castlevania games. What makes Castlevania 3 particularly fascinating, though, is a special chip included in the Japanese release. See, Konami had been experimenting with adding extra sound chips to the Famicom releases, dating back to around 1987. The chip included in Castlevania 3 was the VRC6 chip, which added three additional sound channels on top of the usual find found in NES games. But Castlevania 3, as amazing as its OST is, was not the end, and Konami did not stop there. In 1991, they debuted a chip that could support six additional sound channels with full FM synthesis capabilities. The result in 1991 was Lagrange Point, the only game to ever fully take advantage of the VRC7 chip. It doesn't feel nearly as antiquated as a lot of NES and Famicom RPGs to me as well, uh, and of course with that I'm calling out the original Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest. I mean, there's still some early RPG jank here and there, but Adventure is so unique that it's worth sticking with. So on that note, if you like what you saw today, maybe subscribe. Maybe join the folks you see on screen right now by backing me on Patreon, and maybe leave this video a like. I'm going to be back to more regular content soon, including more documentaries, just as soon as I'm into my new place. And especially right now, as I am moving, every dollar helps. So on that note, thank you very much for watching. Stay classy, and I'll see you next time.